Without this one rocket, the International Space Station as you know it would not exist. We are talking about six decades of human spaceflight on a design that has gone relatively unchanged since the height of the Cold War. A marvel of engineering created by a man who would first have to fail at building a nuclear missile before he could succeed at building an orbital rocket. This is the 60-year history of Russia's Soyuz rocket. The design of the modern-day Soyuz rocket goes all the way back to the mid-1950s and the nuclear arms race of the Cold War era. The Soviet Union had a terrifyingly early advantage over the United States. They had developed the world's first intercontinental ballistic missile, the R-7. As with pretty much all things made in the Soviet Union, the nation's nuclear warheads were exceedingly large and heavy, weighing in at over 3,000 kilograms, so they required an equally stout rocket system to get them all the way across the ocean to rain death on America. No easy task. But there was one man who was up for the job. This is Sergei Korelyov, one of the founding fathers of human spaceflight, the engineer of a Soviet space program that was consistently beating the Americans to the punch right up until his untimely death in 1966. For his venture into rocketry, Korelyov needed a design that would deliver the maximum amount of power and efficiency over the longest flight path. In order to reach the United States, a Soviet missile would need to go all the way up to outer space before coming back down again. To achieve this feat, the R-7 would need to utilize a process known as rocket staging. The idea of a multi-stage rocket goes all the way back to 14th century China. The basic theory is that instead of just launching one rocket, you stack two of them together, a big one under a small one so that when your big rocket burns out, it ignites the smaller rocket, which blasts off and continues the flight. The Soviets were the first to take this one step further with parallel rocket staging. The theory was developed in 1947 by Mikhail Tikhonrovov and implemented for the first time on the R-7. So now, instead of stacking your multiple rockets on top of each other in series, you run them side by side in parallel. Korelyov designed his rocket with four ejectable Stage 1 side boosters that surrounded the Stage 2 core booster. Since the Earth's atmosphere is the most dense at lower altitudes and thins out to virtually nothing at higher altitude, you only need maximum thrust for the first leg of the journey. After that, the booster engines have served their purpose and are no longer necessary. So instead of carrying dead weight, we simply toss them overboard. That's staging. In a rocket that uses sequential staging, the first stage has to carry the weight of the second stage above it. But when run in parallel, the second stage engine can burn for the entire duration of the ascent, eliminating the dead weight. Here's how that worked in the R7. These four strap-on boosters are essentially just fuel tanks with engines at the bottom. The five engines on the rocket use a mixture of liquefied oxygen and kerosene fuel, so at liftoff, the four outer tanks are supplying propellant to all five engines. Then, as soon as those outer tanks run dry, they are ejected from the core. At that point, a fifth fuel tank located in the center of the rocket will continue to power the remaining second stage engine until the rocket reaches the desired velocity. The beauty of the R7 booster is that they don't just lazily fall away when separated. A burst of gas at the tip actually pushes the booster out from the rocket in a backflip maneuver, and when this is synchronized across the four side boosters, they end up tumbling down in a perfect cross formation. This is still known today as the Korelyov Cross. Looking at the R7 from below, it would appear that each booster contained four engines, but that's not the case. The RD-107 engine and its close companion, the R-108, are the inventions of Soviet engineer Valentin Glushko, another underappreciated founding father of human spaceflight who had a longtime rivalry with his colleague, Sergei Korelyov. Glushko's engine is as insane looking now as it was back in the 50s. This 
is one single rocket engine with four separate combustion chambers and nozzles. So why is it like this? The short answer is essentially that the larger an engine's combustion chamber gets, the more likely it is to experience combustion instability. So by splitting the main combustion chamber off into four smaller ones, you get an engine that can have both incredible power and stability. This is why modern rockets trend towards using several small engines instead of just a few big ones, but even today, the logistics of synchronizing multiple engines together can be very challenging. So, for Glushko in the 1950s, his solution was to run the minimum number of engines with the maximum number of nozzles, and it worked fantastically. The R7 had its first test launch campaign in 1957, and while the rocket did succeed at putting a payload into space, the system proved to be much less effective at getting the mock warhead back down successfully and accurately, which is a characteristic one would desire in a weapon of mass destruction. In addition to that, the amazing engineering of the R7 also required a lengthy and complex preparation for launch, so it would take somewhere between 8 and 12 hours to actually get the rocket in the air, at which point in a real-world scenario, the nuclear apocalypse would already have been well underway. So, while not particularly effective as a war machine, the Soviets quickly realized that the incredible power of the R-7 would make for one hell of a spaceship. The first successful orbital rocket in human history was known as the Sputnik in the Soviet Union. Now, I'm not a linguist, but this is something that most English people have tended to screw up for a very long time. Sputnik in Russian is not a proper name, it's a general term that just means satellite, and it covers both artificial and natural orbiting bodies, so a planet's moon would also be considered a Sputnik. The Sputnik rocket, or satellite rocket, was essentially just an R-7 missile with a payload fairing on the top instead of a nuclear warhead and inside that payload bay was a polished metal sphere, a little less than two feet in diameter, with four radio antennas sticking out. On October 4th, 1957, Sputnik 1 reached low Earth orbit, the first satellite. This moment marked the true beginning of the space race, and as the Americans scrambled to catch up, the Soviets pressed on at a blistering pace. Sputnik 2 followed quickly on November 3rd, 1957, carrying a very unlucky dog named Leica, who became the first living creature from Earth to reach outer space, which was quickly followed by the title of the first Earthling to die in outer space. So, rest in peace, Leica. Sputnik 3 came in May 1958 and deployed something called Object D into an orbital path that reached as high as 1,158 miles above the surface. Following this mission, the Sputnik R7 was upgraded with a third stage that used a smaller single-nozzle engine to climb all the way to the moon. Luna 1 was launched on January 2nd, 1959, and was intended to be the first object to hit the moon. It missed, but the probe still managed to become the first human object to go beyond Earth orbit. Luna 2 came later that year and successfully smashed into the surface of the moon, another first for the Soviets. Luna 3 was also launched in 59, and this probe succeeded in taking the first ever photograph of the moon's far side. Sergei Korelyov and his team had obviously accomplished some pretty amazing feats in their first two years of spaceflight with their continuous evolution of the R-7 rocket design. But the Soviet Union was just getting started. In 1960, the Vostok program began the first push towards putting a human being into space. Vostok simply means east in Russian, which is the direction that we always launch rockets to match the rotation of the Earth. The Vostok rocket used the same R-7 booster, now with a longer third stage to accommodate more fuel and a more powerful engine for the heavier payloads of up to 4 metric tons. The new payload was a small, spherical crew capsule that borrowed its design from the Zenit spy satellite. On April 12, 1961, Yuri Gagarin rode a Vostok rocket into the history books as not only the first person to reach outer space, but also the first to orbit the Earth. The Vostok configuration of the R-7 rocket would go on to be used for well over 
100 satellite launches and was in service up until the year 1991. We really can't stress just how fast Karelyov and his team in the Soviet Union were moving with their rocket program. By the late 1960s, there was already an interplanetary configuration of the R-7 in development that was named Molnia, which means lightning. Again, the core stage and side boosters remained unchanged from the R-7 missile design, but the third stage was upgraded to a more powerful quad combustion chamber engine that was very similar to the booster engines with design tweaks to make it function better in the vacuum of space. On top of that, was a new fourth stage of the R-7 with a closed cycle rocket engine that could be restarted in space. That would enable the payload to reach either a Mars or Venus transfer orbit. Over a period from 1960 to 1965, the Molnia rocket would send a number of probes and landers towards Mars, Venus, and the Moon. None of them were successful in completing their mission objectives, but many of them did collect some really valuable information along the way, and Venera 3 did become the first human object to impact Venus, but it unfortunately lost contact with Earth before that happened. Voskhod was the next phase of the Soviet human spaceflight program, and this word means ascent or dawn in Russian. The Voskhod rocket was essentially just a Molnia with the fourth interplanetary stage removed and replaced with a new crew capsule design. On Voskhod 1, the Soviets sent three people into orbit on one spacecraft. And on Voskhod 2, Alexei Leonov made the first ever spacewalk. Then in 1966 was a pivotal year for the Soviet space program. On one hand, this would see the launch of the Soyuz rocket program, but unfortunately, this year also brought the untimely death of Sergei Korolev. The new Soyuz vehicle was designed for the next generation of Soviet space exploration. It was significantly larger and more capable than any crew capsule they had made before. The Soyuz had three main segments, the spherical orbital module with docking port, the aerodynamic re-entry module, and the service module that contains the power and propulsion systems. With this vehicle, the Soviets could extend the duration of their low Earth orbit missions dock with other vehicles and future space stations, even fly around the moon, which was imagined for Soyuz but never actually attempted. The Soyuz spacecraft was lifted into orbit by the same old R-7 booster in the same configuration that was used for the Voskhod missions, although this would now be renamed to the Soyuz rocket, a designation that it holds to this very day, with a design that remains largely unchanged from that first missile test in 1957. But before the Soyuz could become the workhorse vehicle of the Soviet and Russian space programs, it had to go through some pretty terrible growing pains. The first four uncrewed test flights of the Soyuz rocket and vehicle were not successful. One of them spun out and exploded in mid-air, another blew up on the launch pad, and in spite of these issues, the Soviets would go ahead with the first crewed launch of Soyuz in 1967, and this would prove to be a terrible mistake. Vladimir Komarov is famous for being the first person to die in the act of space exploration. His Soyuz vehicle was plagued with technical difficulties throughout the flight, but he did manage to achieve orbit and initiate a successful re-entry procedure. It was a parachute failure that ultimately sealed Komarov's fate. His capsule impacted the ground at a speed of 90 miles per hour, and then burst into flames after a thruster misfire. In many ways, this period would mark a turning point for the Soviet space program. While they were able to leverage the R-7 missile design to gain an early and impressive lead on the Americans, NASA had caught up in a big way with their Gemini program, and the development of the Saturn V rocket and Apollo lunar spacecraft represented a level of engineering that neither the Soviets or Russians would ever be able to match. Even though the Soviet Union ultimately lost the space race, they would never give up their spirit of exploration. In fact, they would continue to improve the Soyuz rocket and vehicle design to make it a safe and reliable system for getting crews into low Earth orbit. They finally got it right in 1973 with the Soyuz U, still the same basic design from the R-7, but with more powerful engines in the first two booster stages. The Soyuz U would be flown continuously for the next 44 years 
with retirement finally coming in February 2017. At its peak during the late 70s and early 80s, the Soviet Union was making between 50 and 60 of these vehicles every year. This is something that the Soviet Union would leverage throughout that time to develop their own space station program. From small single module orbital platforms in the 70s, to the first modular space station Mir in the 80s and 90s, to the ISS that we all know today, which is built largely on Russian power and propulsion technology. The first crew to board the ISS arrived in a Soyuz vehicle, and for the period between the last space shuttle in 2011 and the first Crew Dragon capsule in 2020, the Soyuz was the only method available to reach the ISS. Here's a crazy stat. Since its debut in 1966, different variants of the Soyuz rocket family have launched over 1,900 times, making it by far the most used vehicle in the history of spaceflight. The current operational variant, the Soyuz 2, is still largely unchanged from the original R7 design. It's received another incremental engine upgrade, although even the latest engine still uses Glushko's split combustion chamber design with four nozzles per engine, and the flight controls have been changed over from the analog to digital. That was also the first Russian vehicle to lift off from the European Space Agency's launch pad at Kourou in French Guiana. Unfortunately, the long-standing tradition of cooperation that really came to define the Soyuz spacecraft has mostly come to an abrupt end over the past couple of years. Relationships between the Russian government and the Western nations are about as bad as it's ever been, with no indication that things are going to improve anytime soon. So, as much as I'd like to leave you on a positive note for the future of Soyuz, we're just going to have to wait and see on this one.